This lecture is on the Middle Paleozoic. The Middle Paleozoic are the third and fourth periods of the Paleozoic, that is to say the Silurian Devonian. And if you look at that area enclosed by the red rectangle, you see on this mega evolutionary diagram that there's sort of an adaptive radiation, some ups and downs, some minor extinctions, and then it's going to end with another mass extinction. So it's bracketed by two of the big five. So the end of the Ordovician ex mass extinction, which is number one here, and then the almost at the end of the Devonian mass extinction, number two. Um, before that, there are um, adaptive radiations. So especially throughout the Silurian, what happens is the marine environments that were suffering at the end of the Ordovician, they bounce back. They bounce back in a big way. And there's the roster of a whole bunch of the things that come back, which we'll talk about in just a second in this lecture. And then there's the other big thing that happens in the Silurian. We get the first evidence that life isn't just in the oceans. It's still not on land, but we get it finally in fresh water. Um, and it's clams and fishes. Another view of the same sort of time period, this is a spindle diagram, and again I've enclosed the middle Paleozoic Silurian Devonian in the red bar, the red rectangle, and you can see um, it starts out as a pinched waist, a real thin area, that's the end of the Ordovician extinction. It gets fatter, that's the adaptive radiation, and then it pinches in again at the end of the Devonian, that's the other mass extinction. Well, what's there? brachiopods for one thing. They are the seashells by the seashore of the Silurian Devonian and I would say that if you've ever lived or been where there is Silurian or Devonian or really most of the Paleozoic uh, rocks exposed in some way then you have probably seen or collected brachiopods whether you knew it or not. They're everywhere. Little shelly beasts. Remember these are the things that look like clams because they have two shells that are kind of hinged together, but internally they're vastly, vastly different. What else is there? We have these weird creatures called the Graptolites. Now they're planktic colonial organisms. Uh, the upper picture is them sort of on an actual piece of rock, and you see they've formed these little tuning fork shapes, little saw blade type things, and everywhere there's a notch. If you look at this artist representation below, there would have been a little clone, a little animal, and right next to him or her is a clone. Next to them, another clone, another clone, another clone. And these things floated throughout the Paleozoic oceans. Um, and so we find them typically in every type rock because they, they floated over everything and died down. But we even find them in deep water where there is no oxygen, no other living things. They couldn't live there either, but they lived above it, above it in the water. They would die. Their bodies would rain down. Look at the shape of a lot of these things. They're like those maple leaves, those little helicopter seeds that, um, that kind of fall out of maple trees uh, all the time. We've got a couple in my yard. Uh, this morphology is ideal for an organism or a piece of an organism, in the case of the maple tree, to fall down and then float or helicopter away from that original point. Big group that comes along in a big way in the Middle Paleozoic are the nautiloids and the ammonites and they are mollusks and they are part of what's called the class cephalopoda. Today we just have the octopus, the squids, um, and then the nautilus. But in the geologic past, they were a lot more of them. And they had these shells. And they either had these nice straight shells. See that octopus drawing sort of stuffed in that shell. And that those came first. And then later, they evolved a completely rolled up spiral shell. Uh, this would have been a better sort of swimming, operating, maneuvering in the water type design. And so that's why these forms evolved into those forms. Regardless, they were probably very voracious carnivores, just as octopus and squid are today. Uh, I would classify them as nectic creatures, and they probably were 
quite brainy, big brains. Uh, octopus is probably the brainiest invertebrate creature, creature without a backbone in the entire world. Um, and there's no reason to think that their ancestors weren't any different. The Devonian is also the age of fishes. Now look at this diagram. You've got the time scale on the left here. We live at the top. And so these three types of fishes, they exist with us today. Ray finned fish, cartilaginous, lobe finned fish. But if you look in the geologic past, we had several other types down here. And if you kind of sort of draw a line across the Devonian, you see that the Devonian is the period where we have all of them. So we have such a diversity of fish in the Devonian, it's sometimes called the age of fishes. Just as the brachiopods I showed earlier uh, are so abundant that it's sometimes called the age of the brachiopods. Depends on your perspective and what you're looking at. Going back to the fishes, the earliest ones had no jaws. They literally just had a hole in the front of their face. They would swim around on the bottom, and whatever sort of went into that hole was what they ate. But very shortly, by the Silurian, middle or Silurian, we evolved the first jaws, the same type of jaw that you and I have. And if you look at a jaw um, in a mouth of two different fishes here, the fish on the left is a one of these uh, jawless fishes. They just had a picture an open hole over here. And then all the little pink bodies are gill slits. The little tan bodies are gill arches, little bone sets. And really, all it takes to develop a jaw is to have a natural selection operate on the action end of this fish. Basically, gill arch number one, the one closest to the mouth, if it gets larger and larger and more robust, and then at some point you get a hinge, you can see it's sort of thinning in the middle part here. At some point if you hinge it, then suddenly you have an apparatus that can take bites, can masticate. Uh, that led to all kinds of other fishes. So here's just another artist cartoon of some of the different fishes. Um, of the time. Fish also become top-level carnivores, as this beautiful large fish here is showing it to be. Not just the nautiloids and ammonites, as we see over here. An interesting type of fish that we find uh, is these things called conodonts. And look at the name, cono, conical, dont, teeth, dental, uh, for a century. We only knew them as the little teeth until, and these are small, look at that, submillimeter size teeth, until we actually found this slab that you see in the lower right here in Scotland. And in the head region, there were a bunch of these teeth all aligned and pointing as if they were laid out in some sort of primitive jaw. We now think that this animal is the actual conodont animal and that it is an, a distant, distant ancestor to the modern hagfish, which is shown over here in this um, lower left picture. Let's look at paleogeography in the Silurian and the Devonian. First of all, sea level is extremely high. Look at the blue. It covers virtually all of North America. There's just a few spots in the east where it's not. Um, this is a time of great reefs. The little teal pattern that you see here encircling the Michigan Basin are all reefs. We'll talk about those in just a second. And then where there is land, the conditions are just right for the movement of life onto land. There's warm and moist climates, really sort of globally, or at least throughout this North American area. Going back to the reefs, if you picture an area like this, Here's an artist's rendition of what a Silurian reef might look like. And yes, it has corals, several corals, but there's also sponges and brachiopods and trilobites, all kinds of things. There's one of those nautiloids, uh, squid stuffed in a shell, swimming above, building a big mass um, that is full of life down here. Where are these reefs found? Here's a global map of the Silurian, and everywhere you see a red dot, you see that we've collected these Silurian reefs. Just like reefs today, they're in the tropics between 30 degree north and 30 degree south. 
zooming in a little bit closer to the North American area, we see the Midwest. Now I see Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and here the red belt. The red pattern shows the places where these reefs built up around these deeper basins. And notice that this one here, the upper one, sort of slips through Illinois and up to Wisconsin, where a lot of us um, live, and not too far from us here on this campus. Now this map here shows there's the Wisconsin-Illinois border, and there's a few sort of familiar landmarks, Racine. Of course, the Milwaukee County Stadium no longer exists, but it's in Milwaukee. And there's Wauwatosa, or West Dallas, Wauwatosa, Grafton. And all these little dots represent reefy deposits. Very, very close to us so that the Milwaukee Public Museum for many years had professionals that worked on this set of uh, unique communities and they've built a beautiful displays uh, both in the museum and virtually and so there's the link where you can go see the thing uh, what else what else is happening at this time well a little thing called life moves on land the first things that do it are plants vascular land plants and what you're looking at here is cooksonia it's taken to be the very first land plant with first time we find fossils like this one and this whole thing is maybe an inch tall uh, it's in the Silurian but the tops these little bulbous heads at the top are filled or they were filled with spores the the reproductive seeds if you will for this this plant and those things we actually find a little bit earlier in the Ordovician but bona fide actual first land plants Cooksonia in the Silurian. And the Silurian world would look sort of like this. Notice you've got the land and it is barren. There is nothing on it. You've got water. And we know there's life in there. And then right on the edges of water we get primitive plants that have developed some way to suck moisture out of the water but have their bodies erect into the atmosphere rather than growing into the water. The Silurian world would have looked very much like this wherever you have water you would have a green area a patch of green and there, no, these are these little cooksonias and a few other things uh, living right by the water they still needed moist conditions but once you leave that moist area again you have a barren barren ground but by the devonian plants are everywhere and in fact we have great forests and these things are clearly trees, but they're not trees like you think of trees. These are tree ferns. These are ferns that have grown into giants, as big as modern trees, um, and giant trunk things, but they're ferns. And so they have invaded virtually all of the land environments. How do they do this? They do this in a couple of ways. To grow up, you also have to grow down. And so in this diagram, notice on the, the left side here, there's a scale bar, one meter. And then on the bottom is time, early Devonian, middle Devonian, late Devonian. And notice in the early Devonian, we have little plants with little to no roots. But as time goes by, plants grow up and then they grow support down in the case of longer and deeper and more branching and more complex root types so that by the late Devonian as you see here we have essentially forest type vegetation following the plants we have the first land animals and they are arthropods the bugs the things that eat the plants and then the things that eat the plants, um, things like these, spiders, scorpions, centipedes, millipedes, etc. But the big evolutionary change that happens here is the evolution of vertebrate life on land. And to do that first, I want you to look at these two different fish types, ray finned fish. And these are the fish that most of you know and have caught in your life, sort of bass, perch, uh, things like that, trout. Uh, notice the bones. They've kind of done an x-ray of this fin here. And the bones are all kind of lined up subparallel, pointing out like rays of the sun. That's why they're called ray-finned fish. 
versus the fish on the bottom, the lobe fin fish. And if you didn't have an x-ray of the bones in there, you'd say, well, there's another fish with some fins. But if you look at the bones in those fins, they're vastly different. And in fact, it is this type of fish, the lobe fin fish, which led to the transition to land. It is called the fish to amphibian transition. And we have the lobe fin fishes that evolve into what we call the very first amphibians, which are a type that we call labyrinthodont. I'll talk about that in just a minute. And the next few slides sort of show this transition for us. Um, I'm going to be talking about their overall skeleton, but then their arms and their teeth. So let's look at their overall skeleton. If you just had the head region, uh, the skeleton of the head, they look very, very similar. If you had the spine, spinal column, very, very similar. If you had the fins, though, uh, well, this upper one, this labyrinthodon amphibian, doesn't have fins. It has actual limbs. But this lobe fin creature down here has bones in its fins that are clearly ancestral to these limbs here. Let's look at them. So on the right side, we have the limb of this labyrinthodont amphibian. And, I'm, and going from the extreme right towards the left, you have the shoulder, which would be right here on the extreme right. You have one large bone, labeled H here. It meets at the elbow. And then there are two bones, labeled R and H here. And then there's a bunch of wrist bones and finger bones. This HRU, in fact, is the humerus, the radius, and the ulna. And you and I have the exact same thing. Our bone that goes from our shoulder to our elbow is our humerus. The two bones that go from our elbow to our, our wrist is the, are the radius and ulna. And then we have these wrist and finger bones. And so this evolutionary body plan, which starts here in the Devonian, is held today by all sort of tetrapods, these things that have four limbs that walk on land, including us. How do we get there? If you look on the extreme left, this is the fin of one of these lobe fin fishes. And notice from the shoulder, putting that in quotes, the connection to the body area, there's one bone meeting two bones, meeting a whole bunch of sort of bones at the end. And I hope you can see that Basically, it's the same setup with a humerus, radius, ulna, and then uh, wrist and finger bones. If we look in the mouth of this creature, if we pulled out a tooth, so go back here, you can see in the mouths of the creature these little points here. They did have little pointy, sharp teeth. If you were to pull them out of the head and slice them, get a, get a cross section through them, the left one would be the uh, labyrinthodon, or the right one would be the labyrinthodon amphibian, the, the left one would be the lobe finned fish. And notice it's the exact same pattern. You have three layers. You have a central pulp cavity surrounded by dentine and then on the outside enamel. Uh, why these are called labyrinthodonts are that their teeth have this sort of wavy labyrinth-like pattern. And they got that from their lobe finned fish ancestors over here. If you look at this, this is essentially the same as our teeth. Um, we don't have this labyrinthodont orientation, but we make our teeth out of the exact same chemical compounds. And we have these exact same three layers, pulp, dentine, enamel. Well, let's look at one of the weird creatures of this Devonian period, and this one is called Tiktaalik. And they make a big deal about this one because we found them as relatively complete skeletons, which show um, that gives us a nice glimpse of this transition between fish and the land. Uh, and so the next slide shows Tiktaalik for you. And there it is sort of swimming. Uh, if you go from the lower right to the upper left in this picture, time is going by. And in this 20 million year period in this Devonian, you have these lobe finned fishes 
you have several transitional forms, but Tiktaalik is just one of the best. And notice it has getting it is getting fully um, developed upper limbs. The lower limbs are still sort of fin-like, but by the end of this period, we get fully formed amphibious creatures. Uh, here's these same bones that I talked about in a couple slides ago: humerus in pink, and then radius ulna in red and green. Tiktaalik is transitional, but the actual sort of first or taken to be the earliest or first amphibian is this creature right here, Ichthyostega. And you can find a lot of artist representations of it like this, where it's sort of, sort of half flopped in, half flopped out of the water. This is a pretty big beast, about two to three feet long. And it's looked just like basically a giant salamander, and it is the first vertebrate creature to make this transition to land. I'm going to go back some slides here to show and talk about this. And here's the transition. In the Silurian, we get vascular plants like these. They are followed in the early Devonian by the arthropods, so insects, scorpions, spiders, other arachnids, things like that. Don't forget that we also start getting a huge diversity of plants in this Devonian. And then by the middle to late Devonian, we get fully formed forests on land, but we finally get vertebrates. So it's very important that you remember this order of the invasion of land. Plants do it first, then the arthropods, then the vertebrates. And this all sort of culminates with Ichthyostega and a few other sort of early amphibians like this. Things are going great, but at the end or near the very end of the Devonian, we have yet another mass extinction. So all of these evolutionary occurrences make the Middle Paleozoic very, very important. And a lot of these are great advances in life, both on land, in the water, in fresh water, with plants, with animals, but at the end of the period, there is a mass extinction. And we really still don't know or have a good idea what caused it. Um, and so we just kind of have to move on from there and just say that life ends at the Middle Paleozoic.